Hi everyone, for those who haven't watched my first video on the introduction to PLAB, I'm Dr. Gandhi Monir and I'm a junior doctor. Uh, this is the first of many videos in my PLAB vision series about the diseases of the respiratory system. But before I get to them, it's better to have a good understanding on the mechanism of respiration as it will help us to understand the diseases much better. Uh, this will just be a brief overview on the essentials, but we have another uh, uh, lecture series done by Dr. Muhammad Allah on this same channel. And if you would like to know more on the physiology of any of the systems I cover, just watch his videos. Don't forget to like and subscribe down below. Links to my Instagram, Facebook and Telegram are also in the description below. So I can keep releasing these videos for free. Please support the channel on Patreon. I'll be posting some premium stuff such as me going over cases and question banks at the end of every system. I put the link in the description below and thanks in advance. We'll be going over the lung volumes, then comparing and differentiating between obstructive and restrictive diseases. We'll look at the flow volume loop diagram. We'll go over the pulmonary function test and its components. And finally, we'll go over the AA gradient. Lung volumes. As you can see, the lung volumes are composed of many components, but we'll only focus on four, which I believe to be really important in helping us to differentiate between the different respiratory diseases. These four are tidal volume, vital capacity, residual volume and total lung capacity and each one represents different parts of respiration. The tidal volume means the volume of air you breathe in during a normal breath. The vital capacity is the amount of air you breathe out after full inspiration. Residual volume is the volume of air left in the lungs after fully breathing out. Uh, total lung capacity is the amount of air your lungs can hold after maximum inspiration. The respiratory diseases are classified into two categories, obstructive and restrictive, and each one affects the lung volume differently. Both obstructive and restrictive diseases share one thing in common, and that is breathlessness. But on the other hand, as you can see on the table, there are many differences. In restrictive diseases, they have either a diseased lung, such as a lung fibrosis, or a physical impediment. And because of this, the lungs are usually unable to expand and fully fill with air properly during inspiration. And when we auscultate these patients, they, we tend to hear crackle. In obstructive diseases, there's a mechanical obstruction, like a constricted bronchi, in asthma. This makes it difficult to exhale and thus the lungs are unable to fully empty. And when we auscultate these patients, we hear a wheeze. In restrictive lung diseases, there is usually the inability to expand the lungs properly during inhalation. Hence why in interstitial lung diseases, the lungs are fibrosed and stiff, reducing its compliance. In respiratory muscle fatigue, the muscles of respiration are tired and this causes a reduction in the contractility and therefore the muscles are unable to contract with the proper force and the chest wall can't expand properly and this leaves the lungs without enough room to expand in. In severely obese individuals they usually find it difficult to breathe in rapid enough and deep enough. We call this obesity hyperventilation syndrome. In scoliosis, there is a skeletal deformity of the spine, making it curve sideways. This is just like respiratory muscle fatigue, which means that the thoracic wall can't expand properly and the lungs will have no room to expand in. People with a resected lung will usually give you a restrictive picture, which means a low volume, which is TLC and RV. And this is usually a false positive though, because one lung can't hold the same volume of air 
has two lungs during inspiration. In obstructive disease, they have a problem with expiration due to a mechanical obstruction. In asthma, the problem isn't with the lung itself, but with the bronchi, seen as it's constricted. In COPD, there's excessive mucus secretion, which forms a plug in the small airways. In bronchiectasis, the small airways are dilated and inflamed, which results in infiltrate obstructing the airflow. In cystic fibrosis, it usually occurs in paediatrics, and what happens is, is that the mucus secretions are thicker than normal, and this forms a plug. The flow volume loop is used to identify an obstructive disease, and it is shown in the form of a graph. Uh, as you can see here, on the y-axis, it shows the flow at which you breathe in and out, and this is measured in litres per second. On the x-axis here, it shows the volume of air in the lungs during inhalation and exhalation. As you go from left to right, the lung deflates. Uh, we'll begin with the inspiratory phase, starting at 1.5 litres in volume. And if you're asking why we're not starting from 0 litres in volume, it's because of that the air left over from the previous expiratory phase which we call the residual volume, takes up that part. Uh, here, the flow is at zero, because this is the beginning of inspiration, so no air is coming in. Uh, as you breathe in, the volume of air in the lungs increases, along with the flow, which is, at the, which is the rate of each breath, basically. Uh, the rate would keep increasing before reaching its peak, uh, the volume would also keep increasing until reaching the total lung capacity of si at 6 litres, basically. Uh, but here, the total lung capacity isn't actually 6 litres. Because of the residual volume during in uh, uh, inspiration starts with around 1.5 litres. So, so to get the total lung capacity, you'll have to calculate the differences between the residual volume and the end in spiritual volume. Now, in the spiritual phase, the rate is higher, reaching 8 litres, seeing as we breathe out a higher force and rate, then the rate declines after reaching its peak before it reaches the end in spiritual volume of 1.5 litres. Here, as you can see, is how the loop looks in restrictive disease. Just like the R in restrictive, it is shifted to the right of the normal loop. These patients have a low volume because of the reduced compliance of the lung or the thoracic wall, hence why the loop is smaller than normal. The residual volume is less than normal here because we have less air in the lungs in general and thus less volume of air after maximum expiration. Uh, there's a reduced total lung capacity because of their inability to inhale properly due to the decreased compliance. As you can see in the inspiratory phase, there is sig a significant reduction in the volume and flow. Because of this, it would make sense that the volume during expiration is also reduced. Uh, you can only breathe out what you've already breathed in. In obstructive disease, the loop is to the left of the normal loop, and these patients find it difficult to breathe out because of an obstruction. This causes the air to become trapped in the lungs, so it would make sense for them to have a higher residual volume. In restrictive disease, it was 1.5 litres, but here it's just below 4 litres. Unlike in restrictive disease, these patients don't have a reduction in volume, but if you look at the total lung capacity in the obstructive loop, starting from the start of inspiration, it is just below 4, let's say around 3.5, and at the end of inspiration, it is around 8.5. This will make the total lung capacity at about 5 litres. And in the normal loop, 
the total lung capacity is more or less the same, 5 litres. Because this is an obstructive disease, the loop looks significantly different during expiration. Uh, the slope is more gradual and less steep than the normal loop because of the mechanical obstruction reducing the rate of flow. It never reaches the intended peak of expiratory flow, seeing that it is only at 4 litres per second. Okay, when it comes to the pulmonary function test, we normally think of three things. Spirometry, pulmonary expiratory flow, and diffusion lung capacity. Spirometry and pulmonary expiratory flow are quite similar, but it's just that spirometry is more accurate at detecting obstructive disease. Uh, they both represent expiration, but spirometry represents the volume of air exhaled in one second, whereas peak expiratory flow represents the speed at which we breathe out after full inspiration. In spirometry, we use a device called a spirometer, and this will help us identify those with obstructive disease. It measures the functional lung volume. And what you do is, is you tell the patient to breathe through a mouthpiece as hard as they can, and then the result is placed in a chart like this. The y-axis shows the volume it's held, and the x-axis shows the term. Uh, we'll look at the normal curve first. It's higher than the others, meaning that the volume it's held is greater. Uh, we first need to identify the volume it's held in one second, which you can see here. We call this the FEV1, the forced expiratory flow, I mean, sorry, the forced expiratory volume in one second. And then we go to the highest value on the curve to get the forced vital capacity, FVC, which is the total amount of air forcefully exhaled. Uh, then we put them together in the form of a ratio. We call them the FEV1, FVC ratio. The restrictive curve is quite similar to the normal curve, as you can see. Uh, you can only breathe out the volume you've already breathed in, and in these patients, it's reduced. Whereas in the obstructive curve, it shows a more gradual slope as it takes longer to breathe out the inhaled air due to the obstruction. The normal FEV1, FEC ratio is usually around 80% but in obstructive diseases, it is less than 70%. In restrictive diseases, it is usually between 70 to 80%. Okay, here we have the diffusion lung capacity. It's a test we do to see how much oxygen the lungs can diffuse into the bloodstream. As you can see here, we have the alveoli, which we refer to as the site of gas exchange, and we have on the other side the pulmonary capillaries. The alveoli contains the breathed in oxygen and the pulmonary capillaries contains the carbon dioxide. What happens is, is that the oxygen moves from the alveoli to the capillaries and carbon dioxide the other way. When we're testing the diffusion lung capacity, we don't test it with oxygen. Instead, we use a non-lethal amount of carbon dioxide due to its high affinity to hemoglobin. The carbon dioxide will normally diffuse without any difficulty in a normal person, but let's say that the person has some kind of lung pathology like a lung fibrosis that will make it difficult for carbon monoxide to pass into the capillaries. If you remember from earlier when I spoke about the types of restrictive and obstructive diseases, not all of them were pulmonary diseases. So you see, we use this test to help us to identify the cause, whether it's restrictive or res obstructive. Here, I've divided the obstructive diseases into two, according to their, their DLCO level. Uh, asthma, here is a normal DLCO, because in asthma, the problem isn't with the lung exactly, but with the bronchi, because it's constricted. This will have no effect on the diffusion of oxygen in the alveolar. So this will give an abnormal reading in spirometry and an abnormal AA gradient, which I will speak about next, but the DLCO will remain intact. On the other hand, COPD affects the alveoli by reducing its surface area. So the surface area is less in the alveoli, so therefore less oxygen will diffuse. 
in restrictive diseases, the causes of a normal DLCO, all have one thing in common. They are all extrapulmonary. Diseases like obesity, Mycenae gravis, chest wall deformity, Guillain-Barre syndrome, all have no direct effect on the lung whatsoever. But people with a receptive lung are a bit different. Although the problem is in the lung, due to having one lung, which I wouldn't really call a disease, their alveoli are intact, so oxygen diffuses normally. In acute respiratory distress syndrome, interstitial lung disease and pulmonary edema, they directly affect the lung and alveoli, and thus this causes a decrease in oxygen diffusion. Okay now, lastly, we have the AA gradient. We use this in hypoxic patients to determine whether the cause is pulmonary or extrapulmonary. The capital A means alveoli, and the small a is arterial. It is used to measure the difference in concentration of oxygen in the alveoli and the outer artery. We use the equation partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli minus the partial pressure of oxygen in the artery. Seeing as we can't directly measure the oxygen concentration in the alveoli, we use the equation 150 minus 1.25 multiplied by the partial pressure of CO2, which will give us an estimation of how much oxygen is in the alveoli. Any disease that causes a decrease in partial pressure of CO2 will increase the AA gradient. Uh, the normal AA gradient is between 5 to 15. Anything more than 15 will mean the hypoxia is due to a pulmonary disease. On this table, you have diseases that cause an increased gradient and ones that cause a normal gradient. The ones that fall under a normal gradient all have one thing in common. They are all associated with the decreased ventilation, as in a reduced oxygen getting into the body, meaning a high CO2 in the body but a low oxygen. As I previously said, anything that decreases the partial pressure of CO2 will increase the gradient. In respiratory muscle fatigue, they have tired respiratory muscles that were previously to kidnip but later became overworked so therefore not enough CO2 is being breathed out. In drugs such as opiates, uh, they cause respiratory depression and the effect is similar to respiratory muscle fatigue which means a high PCO2 uh, and no increase in the gradient. In obesity, as I mentioned earlier, they are unable to breathe rapid or deep enough and we call this obesity hyperventilation syndrome. In CNS disorders like Guillain-Barre syndrome, they usually have a generalized weakness in the limbs and also the respiratory muscles, so they too will have a reduced oxygen inhalation and an increased PCO2. In high altitude, the oxygen levels are usually low, meaning you'll be breathing in low amounts of oxygen and therefore you'll have a high amount of partial pressure of CO2. Uh, others, like pneumonia, pulmonary edema, interstitial lung disease, all decrease the diffusion of oxygen. And when oxygen can't diffuse into the capillaries, it will just build up in the alveoli, meaning that there'll be more oxygen in the alveoli than the capillaries, and therefore there'll be a high gradient. And that's it. If you have any questions, leave them in the comment section below, and I'll try and answer them all. Uh, in the next video, I'll go over asthma and all its essentials.